Wonderful. Okay, so what on earth does Pirates of the Caribbean and this iconic Jack Sparrow character have to do with the book of Jonah? We'll get there in a second. But what we're going to do is we're going to start uh, with, with reading the text. So if you have a Bible with you in paper, uh, you can follow along. It won't come up on the screen. We're going to read the whole of Jonah chapter 1. I'm going to give you several minutes to find it. But if you need the index, you can always use that. That's what it's there for. It tells you where books are. So here we go. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for the port. After paying the fare, he went abroad and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. All the sailors were afraid, and each cried out to his own God, and they threw the cargo into the, into the sea to lighten the ship. But Jonah had gone below deck, where he lay down and fell into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. So they asked him, tell us who is responsible for making all this trouble for us. What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He answered, I am a Hebrew. I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified him, them. They asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked, what should we do to make the sea calm down for us? Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied. Then it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew ever wilder before them. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, God, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord and offered sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in its belly three days and three nights. Let's pray. God, as we look at this book, speak to us. Help us to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. How is it that you are speaking to us? Thank you that you're present here as we do that. I've thought about this, I've prayed about this, but now take the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart, and use them in any way that you want. Amen. So, what have we just read in the book of Jonah. This is probably the best, one of the most well-known Old Testament stories, specifically because there's a giant whale that appears, or fish that appears out of nowhere, and swallows a man whole, and somehow, everything is fine. That story is not a normal story. We're gonna track through this book that sticks out because of these incredible things, and and gonna try and figure out some of the the behind-the-scenes stuff that's going on, because on the surface, Doesn't it sound like a children's story? Doesn't it sound like a fairy tale? In actual fact, because I'm an 80s child, I even threw in the little Stretch Armstrong little logo at the bottom, as I call this Tales That Stretch, and my wife, looking at it, said, oh, are we doing a children's series? Because the idea of Jonah sounds instantly like, wow, does anyone take Jonah seriously? Maybe for you, you've been around church for a while, but you're not completely convinced there's a sense of, it's the 21st century. Are we still talking about whales that swallow people whole? Is that still a thing that keeps coming back? So we're gonna track with this book for a few weeks and we're gonna try and uncover some of the incredible things that are going on. Uh, Hopefully, if you've been doing this thing for a while, you've heard me talk about this idea that that the Bible is is a book that that describes itself as being God-breathed. So the, the Hebrew word for that would be, or the Greek word for that would be this, theonupsis which essentially is that very essence of God breathed on this. 
There's this, there's this sense that sometimes it's translated like a word like inspired or uh, inerrant or something like that, but, but simply at its heart, it literally means that God took this book, this Bible, and he breathed on it. Some of the writers are amazing, and some of them are actually not that good. They don't write particularly well, and still God took their goodness and their badness, and it says he breathed on it. Some of the writers are super dramatic, and some of them are super pragmatic. It doesn't matter, it says that God took them, and he breathed on it, and it means that something happens with this book, that it becomes a book that speaks to our deepest, darkest needs. It connects with the very core of us in some way, not because it's always spelt correctly or because the grammar fits perfectly, but simply because God seems like he chose it in some incredible way. But within that book, there's all these different other books. So it's the Bible, but then, for those of you who are unfamiliar, 66 other books. 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New Testament, and then it gets interesting because these books are all different types of books. And if you've read at all, you know that the type of book depends on how, or makes a big difference to how you read that book. It's not as simple as just saying, I'm going to open any old book and assume that it says all of the things, that, or, or everything that it says can be taken just at surface level. We just don't read that way. We read smartly, we read intelligently. If you see a letter that says, dear mother on it, you know you're reading a different letter to one that says, dear sir or madam. There's just instincts that we pick up, and there's ways that we understand that we're reading something very particular. So we're going to look at a couple examples of this. Next, next slide. So firstly, you guys who are at all political know this, right? Your attitude changes to what you see on TV based on either of these two slogans. It doesn't matter whether you would say that you were right or left. Just based on being either, you say, ooh, I don't know about Fox News, I'm not sure. Or you say, hey, I'm finally watching a station that's fair and impartial and balanced. Or on the other side, you say, I'm, uh, I'm not sure about Fox News at all. Or, or you say, MSNBC, it's just left propaganda. I don't believe a word of it. Just based on where you stand politically, you see these two different stations and instantly your awareness of what's being told to you changes. If you sit on the left and you see Fox News, you say, ah, I don't know if I believe this. If you sit on the right and you see MSNBC, instantly your antenna comes up. Am I gonna get the full deal? There's something about us that we know instantly, I've got to react in a particular way. This isn't just true of TV, this is true of literature as well. Next slide. So because I'm a huge nerd in so many things, I love like fantasy novels like Tolkien and all those kind of things, and, and I love stupid, weird stuff on the internet, uh, one of my favorite times of the year is the release of the Bulwer Lighton Fiction Contest Awards. So if you're not familiar with Bulwer Lighton, that's just you and 290 million other Americans, and there's me and this small pocket of weirdos that know exactly who he is. He is the guy that created the famous line, it was a dark and stormy night. It was a dark and stormy night. On the surface, what a great line. It instantly gives you this picture of like, oh, dark and stormy night. But now it's become so cliched and used all the time, you can't put it was a dark and stormy night into serious literature. But you can use it in the Boer Leighton Awards because that's exactly what they're designed to be. It's, the, it's a competition to write the worst opening line for a novel that you can possibly write. So this was my favorite from, from this year. As they sprinted together down the echoing, looping ramp of the deserted Guggenheim Museum, closely pursued by three swarthy members of the resolutely vicious cannoli gang, square-jawed British Royal Marine art historian stroke world's deadliest sniper John Savage and his voluptuous young modern art critic Navarro linguist Samantha Silver cursed architect, interior designer, writer, educator Frank Lloyd Wright for designing such a circuitous route out of the building. What a terrible line! <laughs> <laughs> and, and this is a competition to write the worst one possible, so this is like the cream of the crop. But every now and again, someone writes something that catches you completely off guard. So you think that you're reading one type of literature, and you find that you're reading something completely different. So I'm going to give you the first line of last year's winner, and then you get to see the second line. So here we go. First line is this. 
Cassie smiled as she clenched John's hand on the edge of an abandoned pier while the sun set gracefully over the water. And as the final rays of light disappeared into the star-filled sky, she knew that there was only one thing left to do to finish off this wonderful evening. On the surface, you're reading romance, right? What a beautiful story, what a beautiful narrative. But let's carry on with the rest of the line. Which was to throw his severed appendage into the ocean's depth so that he could never be found again, and maybe after, get some custard. So suddenly you have this moment where you're reading something that you're like, oh, this is a delightful, romancy kind of novel. Everything's going to be nice and friendly. And then suddenly you're like, what am I reading? I'm reading a story about someone's severed appendage being thrown into the ocean. This is like, this is, this is playing with my sense of what is normal. As we jump into Jonah, one of the first things we have to know is this. We are reading a book that is going to play with our sense of what is normal. That doesn't make it not true. It doesn't mean that it's not God speaking to us, but it does mean that if you read it thinking you're reading what it obviously seems on the surface, there's a big chance that you might believe the stories are true and that's great, but you'll miss the whole point of what this author seems like he's trying to do. You can believe the stories are true, are true or you can struggle with them. I think either are fine, wrestling with those kind of things is good. But the main point is the message, and if you miss the message, well then you've missed the whole purpose. Then it doesn't matter if you believe a man was swallowed whole by a fish. If you miss what God is saying through that, it's a disaster. So we're gonna start from the, the, the beginning of this book and wrestle with that sense of, well what is this book? Because on the surface, it seems like it's just an everyday book. Let's have a look. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. So, this book starts exactly the same way as every other prophetic book in the Bible. So this group of books called prophetic, there's a chunk of them in the Old Testament. They all start with a prophet that God speaks to. And then that prophet goes out and he does the prophesying. And it starts uniformly in almost all of them with this sense of the word of the Lord came to Jonah. You could place any other of the famous prophets of the Old Testament in here and it would be correct. The word of the Lord came to Isaiah. The word of the Lord came to Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. And each and every one of them go and do the thing that they are told to do. And this is the pattern and this is what happens. And that's how the literature works. Except when it doesn't. Because what happens with Jonah? The word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. This starts off as a prophetic book and then suddenly becomes a comedy. It's suddenly ridiculous to every Jewish person reading it. A prophet doesn't run away. When you look through the list of Old Testament prophets and read the ridiculous things they were asked to to do, it's incredible. One man called Ezekiel was told to lie on his side for three months and then to switch over and lie on the other side, and he did it. Another called Isaiah was told to walk around naked for three years, and he did it. And God didn't say a word about what he was doing until after the three years were up. And then he said something to the point of, oh, you'll have noticed my servant Isaiah has been walking around naked for the last three years. And that is all the details that anybody got about poor old Isaiah and his forced nudity. Prophets were told to do stuff, and then they did it. It was just that simple. And now suddenly you've got a prophet who's told just a simple thing. Just get up and go to Tarshish. And there's a word missing there because in Hebrew there's this this word essentially that is just yum, which is essentially just arise quickly. Jump up, come on, let's go. Time to move, I have something for you to do. And and that word is is the classic prophetic go. You, You gotta get up. You're my guy, I've picked you, go and do something. And Jonah, goes the other direction. 
Instantly to a, a Jewish person reading this, there's, the, there's that like spidey sense thing again of like, whoa, something's not normal here. There's something weird at play. There's, there's something going on that doesn't fit the genre. It's just like reading that opening clip of what seems like a romance novel and then having this switch of a severed appendage that's been waved around and then thrown in the ocean. This is what's happening to the original readers of this book, Jonah. Why is this prophet not doing what he's supposed to do? So what I've got is, as we're gonna move through this first chapter, I've got what I've called, it's just a series of what questions for you. We're gonna go through and ask what is happening, essentially, in different ways. Because the first thing that I notice here, and maybe you noticed as well, there's something missing. There's something missing. What is missing from this story that we've been given? On the surface, we've read a story about a prophet that has been told to go and give a prophecy, go and do his job, and he's got up and he's left. What we're never told is why. Why is he doing it? In essence, it would be like this. Supposing I were to tell you a heartbreaking story about, about a, a father that has, has chosen to leave his family. It's a heartbreaking story, admittedly. We, it's, it's a story we don't like to hear. But supposing my story went something like this. John woke up on a Wednesday morning. He jumped into his car, having decided to leave his family. He climbed, uh, he drove down Groom's Road. He got onto the highway for a couple of exits. He pulled off at a local McDonald's where he ordered a McSandwich, or whatever they're doing now, with a breakfast trimmings. And then he continued up the Northway and was never seen again. That story gives you some weird details, right? It gives you details like uh, he ordered this particular type of sandwich or he went to McDonald's at all. But again, it misses the point. It never gives you a why. What has happened to this poor guy or his poor family that he suddenly decided to make this incredible decision? What has pushed him over the edge where he's got up one morning and said, I am done with the normal pattern of things. Something has happened in that narrative and we don't know what it is. That's exactly what happens in Jonah here. We're told he runs from the Lord, but why is he running from the Lord? There isn't any reason given for him doing what he's doing. The first thing that I notice about this passage is like, what? what's missing? What is going on in this guy's head? You have been, you've, he's been a prophet for years. There's actually a passage back like in a book called Kings where it talks about Jonah, the famous prophet. It's not like this is his first time out. It's not like he's never done this before, but suddenly this guy who uniformly has done what he's supposed to do, suddenly done with the whole thing. What is missing? Jonah is this weird character. He, he fits that Jack Sparrow mold. We watched that little clip of Pirates of the Caribbean at the start, and, and Jack Sparrow's character, if you've never seen the movie, is the introduction of what's called the anti-hero. And it maybe didn't really exist in the same way before, but you see him on the surface, and there's this hero shot of him arriving, and he looks like a pirate arriving on his ship with his crew and all his glory, and he looks like a guy that will make decisions, and he'll fight the, you know, the good fight or the bad fight, however you look at it. And then you find out, well, actually, no, he's just a guy on a ship that's sinking, and he's constantly making cowardly decisions, and he's not really particularly brave at all, and he doesn't fit the normal mold, and you shouldn't cheer for him, and yet you do. And Jonah, in some ways, he resembles that character. He's supposed to be a prophet, and he's supposed to be heroic, and he's not. And we don't, on the surface, have a clue why that's the case. He's just not that good. And then he makes this strange decision. It says that he goes, instead of to Nineveh, where he's asked to go, he goes to a place called Tarshish. Now, if you're not familiar with geography in, in this period, and we're talking somewhere about, somewhere between 700 and 500 BC, Joppa, uh, sorry, Nineveh and Tarshish, they're about as far away as you can get from each other in the known world at that time. Obviously, there's huge parts of the world that were unexplored or, or unknown, then the whole American continent is basically missing, but, but for a guy in this time period, if you were to try and get as far away from the two places as possible, if you were trying to, someone sent you to Nineveh, going to Tarshish was like the absolute opposite. And that's Jonah's decision. Not only is he not going to do what he's told to do, he's gonna go as far the other way as he possibly can. 
Now, to the, the original reader, maybe it would have simply been that they know that actually Tarshish was a pretty nice place to go. Uh, Tarshish is actually in, in modern-day Malaga in Spain, so it looks something like this now, which I guess on the surface you'd be like, oh, okay, I could understand going there. But Jonah's decision doesn't make sense on the surface. Jonah essentially is saying, I'm going to try and escape God's presence, and I'm going to do it by going to one of the most beautiful places I can possibly find. In today's terms, or maybe not today's terms, it's not fair to sort of to, to, to malign cities now, but let's take 1990s Brooklyn. I love like just little nerdy facts about, about just how words change. And Laura and I were watching one of our favorite movies the other day, and there's a girl that lives in Manhattan, uh, and she's talking about the fear that she's going to lose her apartment. She's like, it's a disaster. I'm going to have to move to Brooklyn. And you're like, wow, now in the 21st century, you'd be, you'd be lucky to move to Brooklyn because CEOs can't afford to live in Brooklyn. But apparently Brooklyn in the 90s was awful. Uh, and so imagine being told by God, that you need to go to Brooklyn, or downtown Albany, or some other area that you're like, oh, this isn't a great place to be right now. And then to escape that God, you run off to Southern California. On the surface, when you think about nature, creation, beauty, all those different things, you're kind of like, wow, why would you assume God wasn't in Southern California, but he, but he was in Brooklyn? Why would you think you could escape God by running to beauty instead of something that was ugly. Like, you're kind of like, well, well what, what is going on in Jonah's mind? Why does he think that this makes sense? And as we delve into this book, what you find with this character Jonah is that he's constantly stuck in this binary world. And this author and the God that's behind this author is going to mess with him and mess with us all the time. Because we live in a binary world too. Every one of us, I would suspect, has done what Jonah is doing. Instinctively, we run away from things that are painful, and we run towards things that we think are joyful. So to give you a pictorial image, what I've got is a couple of things to add to these weird little signs that I've got here. Probably all stuck together now, but we can soon fix that. So in Jonah's mind, what is happening here is this. Nineveh, in his mind, is painful. Oh, I got it, don't worry. So Nineveh is pain, and he doesn't want to go there. And for some reason, all the way over the other side of the world in Tarshish, he gets this sense that there's joy. There's something about running away from what God has told him to do that says, I'll be happy here in a way that I won't be happy there. And isn't that what we do? Don't we run towards things that are joyful? They don't even have to be bad things. There's nothing wrong with Tarshish in its own right. Tarshish is a great place. As we just saw, it's beautiful. The only problem with Tarshish is it's not where Jonah's supposed to be. But we constantly run after things, I think, that we assume will bring us joy. We run after a new car because we think it will bring us joy or a bigger car because we think it will bring us joy. We run after a new house or a bigger house because we think it will bring us joy. We run after a new relationship because we think it will bring us joy. And none of those are bad things in their own right, but the thing is that sometimes our binary world, just, it's just not right. Sometimes the thing that we think brings joy doesn't bring joy in quite the way we assumed it would. And sometimes the thing that we think will bring pain is actually an experience which will transform us in ways that we never quite imagined that it would. There's nothing wrong with Tarshish. There's nothing wrong with joy. It's just not at that time where God wants Jonah to be. As humans, we instinctively we run towards joy, and then we run away from pain. I have this recurring memory of a childhood of running a paper route 
I used to have to get up seven days a week at about six o'clock in the morning, and I would go and I would grab my bike, and, and I would go to the different houses, but there was one house that was down the bottom of this dark alley, and I remember that experience every morning in the winter at six o'clock when it was pitch black of having to go and deliver this paper and leaving my bike and walking down the last part of the trail, and just the intense sense of, ah, I don't want to go there. Everything within me wants to run in the opposite direction right now. Now, actually, under the surface, there was nothing scary about it at all. In the daylight, I wasn't, I wasn't bothered. In the daylight, I actually knew that at the end of the alley, there was just a brief little bit of woods, and then there were more houses afterwards. But something about it in the dark had this sense of terror for me, and something about me said, run in the opposite direction as fast as you can. Something about, Tarshish, about Nineveh terrifies Jonah. There's something about him that says, go in the opposite direction. And I wonder what that is for us. One of my questions would be, what for you is Nineveh? What for you is Tarshish? What is that thing that you long to run away from? Perhaps it's the fear of this life ending. Perhaps it's the fear of not having enough or not being successful enough. There's so many things that can fit that category of deep, dark fear that we're like, oh, I have to avoid that. But Jonah's binary categories tell him this. Weirdly, they tell him God is not here, and he is here. They tell him God is not here, where he thinks there is joy, and God is here, where he thinks that there is no joy and he thinks there is pain. And in that, weirdly, without knowing it, he's absolutely right at times. There are times where we choose to run towards something that, we're, that, that, that we think is joyful, and we find it to be empty, and there's times where we choose to go to places that seem to be intensely painful, and we experience God in ways that we never have before. I just watched a, uh, a brief clip of, of this guy, um, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, who's become a bit of a superstar over the last however many years, and he looks amazing, so there's no reason he shouldn't become a superstar, and the guy works out like crazy, and he seems like he's a really fun-loving guy, but he just lost his father in this sudden experience, and I watched as he gave this eulogy for this father that he'd lost, and he went through all the normal motions that you would expect. It took him a while to get his words out. There was this deep sense of pain and loss, and he talked about how, ah, I wish I could just have one more conversation with him, just tell him one more time that I loved him. But then something incredible happened. He started to talk about what losing his father had done for him and his family and his community. And he suddenly started to expand on how just in the last couple of weeks since it happened, he said, suddenly we're so much closer than we were before. Suddenly we've begun to have conversations that have been needing to happen for ages and they haven't happened and suddenly they're happening and he said what I know is this. He said as painful as what I'm going through is now, right as soon as we walk through this, out of this door, out of this service, something is going to be different. There's a difference in our family now, there's a difference in our community now and from this experience we are stronger and we have experienced the divine in ways that we hadn't before. He has been to Nineveh, and it has changed him. His family have been to Nineveh, and it has changed him. God doesn't ask Jonah to go and fix Nineveh. He just asks him to go there. It's God's job to fix it. But he does say there's something about going to look at pain, to look at things we don't want to look at, to look at those deep, dark places inside us, to look at the brokenness inside us, and to name it, and to admit that it's there. The word confession in the Bible, we quite often think means to say that you're sorry for something. But it doesn't actually mean that. It actually just means to come into agreement about something. So you say the same thing as God says. So when you have done something wrong, yes, confession is about saying, I have done this wrong, but it's essentially saying, God, I agree with you. You said don't go there, and I did. Or you said I should be doing this, and I didn't. 
You come into agreement with this God that has a particular way for us to live. So, so confession for us in this instance isn't about saying we've done something wrong, but it is looking inside us and saying, I am scared of Nineveh. Whatever that is. I am a broken mess. I am hurting. I don't have all the answers. There's this terrifying disease that occupies the minds of about 50% of the population called male answer syndrome. If you're married to a man, you understand what this is. It's this sense that guys always have to know what they're talking about. So if you say to a guy, can you have, give me directions to, to this place, most of us will say, oh yeah, I can. Even if we have no clue what we're talking about. It's terrifying and we're messed up people. I'm just naming it, I'm just <laughs> confessing it. But male answer syndrome can lead you to some horrible places. I remember as a 14-year-old this distinct memory of, of being asked about a movie that came out. I'm going to age myself by telling you it was this movie called Speed, which was about a bus doing incredible things. And I remember my friends saying, oh, have you seen the movie? And saying, yes, I had. In actual fact, I'd gone to try and get into the movie, and because it was rated 15, and I was only 12, and I looked about 10, they said, no, you can't go in. And so I didn't see the movie yet at all. And then I had these conversations as I tried to keep up the pretense that I was fully on board with everything that had happened. They talked a little bit about the plot, and, and I was like, yeah, I remember the bit with the bus. That was really good. <laughs> and what actually needed to happen in that moment was this. I needed to look at them and say, no, I haven't seen that movie yet. I haven't seen it yet. Going to Nineveh is, is just that simple at times. It's that simple honesty with God. I haven't, I haven't got it all together. I actually am not what I should be. I am actually at times terrified of what comes after this life. I actually, God, at times, am not sure what you're doing and I don't know why you're sending me to Nineveh, when Tarshish seems so much more joyful. This is Jonah's what, this is Jonah's why, this is what he is wrestling with. This is Jonah's struggle. But what's funny about this book is, again, this book will go back to comedy. It will lighten the, the spirits. Because as we move on to what's next, we see that this God that he thought he could escape by going where he thought he wasn't actually just turns up where he is anyway. That seems like a very tangled sentence, but it happens to be true. In the middle of this storm, this God will turn up. Then the Lord sent a great wind on the sea, and such a violent storm arose that the ship threatened to break up. And this is the only time in the Old Testament, if you're a language nerd like I am, that the Bible talks about an inanimate object having feelings. Uh, the, the Hebrew is actually just hishkala la hishkala. It actually means that the ship basically thought to itself, I'm done with this. The storm is too bad, I'm just going to fall apart. That's the literal sense of the language that we're reading here. It doesn't do it anywhere else, but right now, this guy wants to give us this sense of, no, this is how bad it's got. Even the ship doesn't want a part of this story anymore. All the sailors were afraid and each cried out to his own God and then they threw the cargo into the ship, into the sea to lighten the ship. Next slide. But Jonah had gone below deck where he lay down and fell into, the deep, into a deep sleep. The captain went to him and said, how can you sleep? Get up and call on your God. Maybe he will take notice of us so that we will not perish. So we started off with a God that told a prophet to go and do your job, and he didn't. And now we're in the middle of a storm, and we've got sailors who are foreigners who don't know this God, who are up there praying, please, whichever God I worship, please save me. And we've got a prophet who is asleep. Sailors who are praying, prophet who is not praying, sailors who are concerned about what God is saying, prophet who couldn't care less. In the midst of the most powerful storm, this perfect storm that they've never experienced before, the prophet is asleep, not doing anything. Again, it's comedy. It's a joke, not in the sense that it didn't happen, but the author is asking us, like, what is going on here? It again plays with our binary sense of like who is good and who is bad. It plays with our sense of which characters are really listening to God and which characters aren't listening to God. And maybe you've experienced that in this world as well. 
to return to the political question that we asked earlier. Have you experienced that binary sense of this side is good and this side is bad? And when you've looked at it on the sur under the surface, you're like, I don't know how I feel about that. I think that there's probably aspects to both sides where God is like, no, I I'm on board with that. And there's, there's aspects to both sides where, where you wonder if God's like, ooh, I don't know about that. The binary thing, when you look at it under the surface, it just doesn't make sense. You're forced to accept these two different options, and you're like, no, I just don't think that fits. The answer's got to be somewhere more in the middle. Perhaps you've grown up in a church world where you were told, like I was, that you shouldn't listen to music that was secular because there was this divide between spiritual and secular. I went through these moments where I gave away CDs that weren't specifically Christian music because I had this sense of, oh no, there's the, there's the good and there's the bad. And then yet we've all come across music in the secular category that's life-giving and wonderful and seems to have God stamped all over it. And we've all come across Christian music that's awful and terrible and should never have been written. The binary options just don't work in the way that, they, that we think they should work. And Jonah, this prophet, this godly person, is thrown into the midst of these group of people that shouldn't be hearing from God and yet act far more like God than the prophet ever will. Again, this book plays with our sense of, well, what's normal? What's going on here? Why don't the normal rules work anymore? And I think it does it because every one of us in life experiences those moments where we're saying, it feels like the normal categories don't work right now. I'm not sure what is going on here. This book has this comic tone after comic tone after comic tone. Next slide. My third what question is this. What shows us God is there? Jonah experiences God in a place he never expected him to turn up. And I think we experience the same. Jonah sees God in a group of people that shouldn't know how this God acts or behaves or would want them to behave. And we constantly see the same. Next slide. And then the story continues. Then the sailors said to each other, come, let us cast lots to find out who is responsible for this calamity. They cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah, so they asked him, tell us, who is responsible for making all this trouble for us? What kind of work do you do? Where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? Next slide. So this is what happens when the outsiders meet the insiders. That was my second question. I think I went out of order. Keep going. He answered, I am a Hebrew, and I worship the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. This terrified them, and they asked, what have you done? They knew he was running away from the Lord because he had already told them so. And then, more comedy. Jonah's reply, literally, in Hebrew would be this. I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God, of the, the God that made the sea and the dry land. Jonah clearly doesn't fear God. If he'd feared him, he would have done what he was told to do. Jonah's clearly living a life where he isn't worshiping God, isn't fearing him in any way. The sailors are the ones that are doing that really well. Jonah's a mess. And everything that the sailors do seems to mock him. It seems to laugh at him. The captain, when he says to him, get up and pray, uses the same words that God used when he said, get up and go and prophesy. The whole thing is designed to, to laugh at Jonah, this guy that isn't doing what he's supposed to do this failed prophet, this anti-hero. And yet the sailors are terrified. They asked him, what have you done? They have this sense of suddenly they've experienced this God. They came from a nation that experienced, that believed God's occupied certain geographical areas. So to hear about a God that, that proclaimed to rule sea and land was terrifying. Suddenly this God doesn't play by the rules they expect to work either. The whole process is just this sense of what is going on here. And as we come to the conclusion of the first part, we see Jonah finally coming to that point where something wakes him up. The sea was getting rougher and rougher, so they asked him, what should we do to make the seas calm down for us? Pick me up 
and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. We start off with a prophet who's told to prophet, prophesy, and he runs. He experienced these sailors that act far more like this God than he ever does. And slowly, as they start to ask this question, what do we do now? He starts to get to this point of, of waking up. Suddenly starts, it seems, to come to this point of realization. Next slide. Instead, the men did their best. Sorry, go back to the one before. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Next one. Instead, the men did their best to row back to land, but they could not, for the sea grew even wilder than before. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man, for you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this, the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. Jonah gets to that point where he's like, for all the sense of joy, for all the sense of this was where I felt like I wanted to be, I'm giving up. God will take me where I need to go. God will do with me what he will. But suddenly he comes to this realization that these men's lives that he's, he's got thrown in with are more important. And this is his wake-up point. This is him coming back to the character he was supposed to be all the time. This is the anti-hero becoming a hero in some weird way again. This is the redemption beginning of Jonah. And I think that that's the hope for each of us. That in our moments of running from Nineveh to Tarshish, in the moments of running to what we think it will bring us joy, even when it's empty, in the moments of running away from the thing that terrifies us, and, and believing that even if there is no God here, even if God is absent, that we'll be happy in some weird way, something hopefully brings us back. And my final question will be, well, what is it that brings you back? What is it in those moments where everything isn't as it should be wakes you up? There's this beautiful story set out in the Great Plains. Apparently, there are, there are snowstorms in the Great Plains that come in so quickly that there's been stories where farmers have gone out to look after their animals, and the squall has come in so crazily that they can't find their way back to the house. And then they've died out just a few a couple of hundred yards away from their home, from safety, because they just couldn't see. They had no way of getting back. So apparently what people started doing was this. They started taking ropes, and the farmer's wife would tie the rope around their husband. And when he went out into the snowstorm, when he didn't come back, there was this connection. They would pull on the rope to let them know that they would lo were lost, and then the person in the house would begin that process of pulling them slowly back, of guiding them back to the place of safety, of guiding them back to the place of home. It's this beautiful picture of, of grace. There's something in that Jesus story that even in our brokenness, in times when we feel like we've done a Jonah thing, there's this whisper of it's still okay to come home. It's still okay to come back. There's grace here. There's forgiveness. There's a new story to be told. You may have felt like you've been to Tarshish. You may have felt like you've been lost at sea. You may have felt like all of your categories of what's right and wrong have fallen apart, but somewhere there's this story of, no, it's okay. Come back. There's a new thing. We can start again. This is where we land at the end of Jonah chapter one. A prophet who doesn't prophesy has become a man who's willing to be thrown into the ocean to save the lives of others. The rest of the story we'll get to, but for this first week, that's where we land. We land with that story of grace. And so my question for you would be this, what brings you back? Let's take a moment to pray.